look at where we left off last time. Where we left off last time, we were do using absolute positioning. And absolute positioning is where you define exactly where things are going to appear based on position from the top and position from the left, typically is how it's done. You could do from the bottom and right, but that doesn't really make sense. So, this is the example we had. And again, my purpose in these is to take the design so far, and then you certainly could uh, wrap it up. In this case, um, we wanted to use a background image. And again, the background image is, is more than decoration. I mean, right off the bat, the background image tells you that this is a pizza place. All right? And yet the text doesn't appear very good against it. We could play with the colors if we wanted to, but one thing that we did instead is we gave it uh, a somewhat transparent background. And that seems to work pretty good. All right? Now, as we get to doing more and more with CSS, testing browser compatibility is going to become critical. All right? Especially if you're going back to older browsers. Browsers have gotten better as far as um, having compatibility issues, but it's, it still can be a, a factor, again, especially when you go back. Now, in this case, if we view our page in Internet Explorer, whatever version of Internet Explorer we're, we're getting, notice that the transparent isn't transparent. It shows up solid. Now, we have to decide what to do at this point. All right, because we could take a couple of approaches, and either one of them is valid. All right, I could look to see if there's a workaround, if there's something that I could do to make transparency work for, I believe this is Internet Explorer 8. All right, the other thing I could do is I could say, well, hey, that's not exactly how I intended it, but it doesn't look horrible. They can read it, they can still see the background image, so I'm just going to leave it like that. All right. A third option would be to totally rework the design, maybe to get rid of the background image and things like that. All right. So you have a choice is the bottom line of how to address it. And any one of those approaches can be valid. All right. Uh, the nice thing is about a lot of these CSS is if a browser doesn't support it, it doesn't completely break it. In other words, the browser will still show as much of it as it can. So I said the background should be white, so it made the background white. It didn't, uh, um, you know, it, it didn't totally break. As it turns out, if I go and do a search for CSS transparency, if I can spell. I E eight. You'll see everyone in the world complaining about the problem that we had, that this doesn't work. And we will see a potential fix for it. I'm going to copy this whole thing in there into our style sheet. And I'm going to go into style. And I'm going to paste that in. I'm going to do it first for the header to make sure that it works. All right, it works. So I can go in and paste it in the other section as well. I hope I 
get it all here. And we have a page that looks the same across the different platforms. The point of this is a couple things. First of all, you have to test across platforms because you never know what is and isn't going to work. Well, at some point, let me rephrase that. At some point, you are going to know after you've done this uh, enough. But uh, it, it is not always predictable what is and what isn't going to work um, uh, until you've done a million of these. I mean, I knew opacity was a problem. That's why I, I tested it out. The bottom line is, again, your choices are to look for a workaround to say, well, that's good enough the way that it was, or possibly just to revise your design. And all of those are valid options. I'm not going to say that any one of those is superior than the other. In, in depending on the circumstances, you might do any one of those three strategies. All right. The ideal, of course, is to have your page look identical on every, on every desktop browser. All right. We'll talk a little bit different when we get to mobile phones. But on every desktop slash laptop, the ideal would be for it to look identical. But that's not necessarily realistic. Um, especially if you're going back and supporting older browsers. Um, now, how far back do you go to support browsers? That's a whole topic. Um, there are statistics out there about what browsers people use. And if you run a website, sometimes you can get statistics specific to your site. All right. Because you, know, you can get some general st statistics about browser usage, but any given site, those statistics could be skewed one direction or another. All right? If, for example, you did a graphic design website, you might have a lot of high-end users who are all using the latest browser. Whereas if you do a more general public sort of website, you might get, a, uh, you might get some older browsers. Someone sitting in the library somewhere using Internet Explorer 7 or something in some library that couldn't afford to upgrade their machines or doesn't have the time to upgrade them. So again, that's tricky business how far back you go in support. But ideally, you want to test across as many platforms as possible. We should also test this on a Mac all right, and verify that it, it works there as well. We should test it by resizing the window and seeing what happens. Test at different screen resolutions. Really, testing a website is a, a big thing. And again, that's really the challenge of, of a website. It's, it's one thing to make a web page that looks good for your particular situation. It's another one that's going to look good across platforms. And that really is where a lot of the aggravation, uh, but that's where a lot of the skill comes in the web design as well. All right. Next approach we're going to take is, again, this is absolute positioning, where we specify in pixels position from the top and position for the left, from the left. There's another kind of positioning that we can use that is called relative positioning. And I'm going to make a third version of this site. Notice that in all these cases, I'm not touching the HTML. I am just changing the CSS. So let's go in here and we're going to use relative positioning. And in order to demonstrate the way where relative positioning works, I'm first going to get rid of all the positioning in this. So I'm going to get rid of the top and left for each one of these pieces and position absolute. So I'm keeping all the other styling, but I'm getting rid of anything dealing with the positioning. And I think I...
I am confused. I'm going to back out of this and try re-editing it. So let's get rid of this. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And let's get rid of this. And I'm going to put in for the nav, I'm going to put in a width of 150 pixels. I think that's why I was confused. There's no width with that. All right. So when I do that, My stuff is organized as blocks like that. And what that is known of is, is that's just a flow layout, right? Because the things flow, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. So if you don't specify anything with layout, that's what you're going to get, all right? So I took the previous layout, which was absolute, where things were nailed down in certain positions, and I removed all of those, and so the layout of this reverted back to the flow which is just first thing, second thing, third thing, fourth thing. All right? Now, when I say relative layout, what I mean is I want to position things relative to where the browser normally wants to put them. So, let me draw what I mean. Oops. Right now, the position of the stuff is like this. Header, navigation, content, and footer. I ultimately want it to be like this. Header, navigation, content, and footer. So how can I achieve that? Well, the one way we saw that we can achieve it is by putting in the exact specific position for each of these, top and left. All right? But that can actually be a lot of work. Really, what I want to do is I want to shift this guy to the left a bit, I'm sorry, to the right a bit, and up a bit. So I want to move this guy until it's there. So I'm going to go over and up. And then I want to shift the footer up a bit. So I'll end up with that. That's where relative positioning comes in. With relative positioning, you specify the layout, not in terms of position from the top and position from the left, but in terms of where it should be relative to where the browser normally wants to put it. All right? The browser wants to put this guy here. The browser wants to put that guy there. That guy there. Well, I want this guy to be over to the left. Um, why do I keep saying over to the left? Over to the right and up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for this guy, I'm going to say position relative, and I'm going to say left. 175 pixels. That will push it over 175 pixels to the left, or, or from the left to the right. So, I'm going to say left, 175 pixels, position relative. I'll save that and look at it. And that pushed it over 175 pixels to the left. So now what I want to do is I want to push it up. So I can specify a top and give it, I don't want to push it down from the top, I want to push it up so that would actually be a negative number. So I'm going to say top 
negative 125 pixels, let's say. Yeah, maybe a little too much. All right. So that's kind of how I want it. And then this guy I got to bring up a little bit. So I'm going to say on the footer, and I get that. I'm going to make then, I'm going to cut off a little bit of the width of that guy. So I'm going to say width. 400, let's say. All right. And there, essentially, I have the same layout as I had before, except it's a lot simpler, because I didn't have to position everything. I just positioned things in terms of um, where they normally should appear. All right. So I didn't have to detail and get each pixel right and all that. I just shifted a couple blocks over. All right. One, one guideline that I can give. A lot of times after we, I've gone over CSS positioning, um, I will get students that will um, do overkill with it. They, they start what I would call like micromanaging the CSS. And they'll start putting in positions for every little thing, all right? And they might end up with a page that looks good, but it is very fragile. That is, if you change something small in the CSS, you're liable to wreck the whole page, all right? One thing that you want to do is you don't want to fight against the browser's default behavior. A lot of the browser's default behavior is good, all right, the way that it works. You just want to sort of go with the flow and sort of just nudge the browser's default behavior into giving you the kind of layout that you want exactly without having to go in and code a whole bunch of stuff, all right, if that makes sense. So sometimes simpler is better and don't try to micromanage um, the layout with this. Now let's say I want to center this, all right. I should be able to center this by simply adding margin 0px auto to each of these elements. Let's see what that does for us. Auto will center it. So in other words, remember that when you specify two values for the margin, you're specifying the top, so that's 0px, auto on the right, 0px on the bottom, auto on the left. So the effect of that is that it should center it. All right. Well, this is a little bit off, all right? Um, and we can probably fix that by nudging the nav over Left, yeah, negative 150, let's say. All right. Maybe a little bit more. Not that much more.
and then we want to nudge that one over. So that's already going too far, so let's make that. We're getting there, and we could, we could, that's what I like about teaching, is I can take it so far and say, well, you can finish up the rest if you want to do that, all right? But you get the idea. Now, there's a neat thing that you can do to sort of make your life easier. This does require, however, creating what's called a container, all right? In other words, if I'm going to look at this page the way it is now, in a nutshell, I have my page and I have a little block in the center floating that contains these four things. So I want to treat those four things sort of like a unit, all right? I can do that by wrapping those four elements in a container. And then I can put some styling on the container. So let's go and let's do that. Um, the problem with this is it's going to require me changing the HTML. So let me copy this. I'm going to get the index right, then I'll clone it to the other ones. Now this is the first time we have touched the HTML since, we've, since we got our template down. All right. And you could, you could make this a couple of different ways. I might use a div. And I'm going to say ID equals container. Now I can start to apply styles to that container. So, I'm going to go into my style sheet. And I'm going to get rid of all the positioning again. And all the margins. We should be back to where we were a couple minutes ago. All right, and we are, right? Because since I removed all that stuff from there, it's now in the flow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify a width for the container. And since that's not an HTML tag, it's an ID. I'm going to say pound sign container. I'm going to say width of 580 pixels. Margin 0 pixels auto. So what that's going to do is that's going to center my whole block, which consists of these four elements on the page. So I don't have to center each one of those individually. I'm centering the block.
So now the block is centered. And now if I want to do the relative positioning, I can push up the section and push up the footer to get what I want. So I can say um, left. Hundred seventy five PX top negative one twenty PX position relative. And now I have this layout, and the nice thing is, is notice how it moves. All right, because the automatic margining, and everything stays in its right place, like that. All right? So, you can do some neat things by wrapping things in a container. One of the things that you could do, for example, is I could put this background business on a container. And then that whole area. Now if I took, put it on a container, I'd want to also get rid of it from the individual ones because um, it's actually overlapping the colors. So I could go in and and get rid of the, the opacity and background on each individual thing. Assuming I wanted to do that. And now I have a block like that that is in the middle of the page where I have my writing and you can see the image poking out um, underneath it. Now, if I do that, I can even do something like this now. that a little bit smaller. I could even get rid of the opacity altogether if I wanted to. And I have some of these positions are a little off, but um, I then have a, a sort of a frame of an image poking around the background of that. Um, let me tweak a couple of these things a little bit. And again, I could fiddle with it to get the exact look. One thing that you see very common with backgrounds, one thing that we haven't talked about yet, is tiling of backgrounds. Here I used a background image that covers essentially the whole screen. I used a big, giant background image. And that's not horrible. And with today's fast internet connections, that's not as bad as it used to be. But one thing you can do is you can actually tile images together. Um, let's say if I take an image, a background image, that is simply a small square. Here's my page. Let's say my background image looks like a diamond 
with a circle in it. All right. And I'm doing that to indicate that the, there's no outline of it. It's just a diamond with a circle in it. If I make that the background image, if I don't specify otherwise, it's going to repeat that image. And if the tile is designed correctly, it will create it to form sort of an interlocking pattern like that. Similar to what you do like if you have like, uh, like wall tiles or floor tiles that have a certain design on them, right? You, uh, the design is such that when you organize them and, and group them together, that sort of another design comes out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and Google CSS background tiles. There's actually a tile generator. Doesn't that look exciting? Oh, I don't know why I'm fussing about this. I'm just going to pick one. I'll pick that one. And we'll change the color. I guess the color is if I draw on it. All right, whatever. Actually, well, we'll do this and we'll, we'll get another one. I'm going to download the PNG. And it's just a tiny image that's like a little V. And then I can go in and put up my images folder. Change it to BG. Then I can go and make up make it the background. And there's our background. And notice how it sort of links together. Even though the, the image itself is just a little like V-shaped thing, when I tile it like that, it forms a, a pattern. All right? Now, that was a nice little pattern generator tool. All right? We also have, um, you know, you can also download from places already sort of finished tiles. So let's go and let's look at one of those as well. Subtle patterns. Oh, doesn't that look nice? Let's download that.
right there, there's the Paisley pattern. I'm going to copy that into my Wednesday folder. And I can go and set this to Paisley. And now I get that sort of pattern, which is, I don't know if it's good for a pizza shop, but it is, it is probably a nicer pattern than that one that probably would make me dizzy if I stared at it too long. Why didn't what color come through? Um, I'm not, no. Oh, the, the, preview, the preview is just, that green isn't meant to be the color of the pattern. That, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what that green represents. But um, Now, one thing that we've done in all of these is we've used um, absolute pixel sizes for the width, all right? Again, depending on the kind of monitor you have, that might not be a good idea. If you have a real gigantic monitor, for example, um, and I used 500 pixels, my web page would look like a little postage stamp on it. All right. On the other hand, uh, if I used 1,000 and I had a real small old monitor, again, in the library that can't upgrade its equipment, my page is going to be bigger than the screen. I'm going to have to scroll. So another way that you can specify widths and heights is via percentage. All right. So I'm going to make the width of the page. I'm going to change the container. And this is another handy reason to have a container. I'm going to make the width of the container to be 75% of the page. All right. So that So that center section where I've grouped my four things is going to be 75%. So if I make the screen narrower, it's going to make it narrower. If I make it wider, I'll make it wide. Now, I'm going to go in and I'm going to say the width of the header, I want to be you know, 95%. The width of the nav, I want to be 20%. Sure. Thank you. The width of this, I want to make 60%. And the width of this, I'm going to make 95%. Now, when I specify the width of the header, for example, when I specify the width of something as a percentage, it's the percentage of whatever container it's in. So, that 95% is not 95% of the whole screen, it's 95% of the container, because the header is within the container. So if I were to look at this, got to save it, I think. As I make it bigger and smaller, it makes the columns bigger and smaller. So I said this is 95%. Well, it's 95% of the container's area. Whoops. Now, notice when you do this, if you take it to the logical extreme, at a certain point, stuff starts like overlapping and all that. Like if I get right around here, notice that, well, starts getting ugly, all right? I can put a stop to that by putting a minimum width, where I can say, all right, make it 75%, but never make it smaller than, say, 
I'd have to estimate where things start going bad, but I'll say give a minimum width of the container of 700 pixels. So, it'll get smaller to a point, but then it won't get any smaller than that. Or, if I, to make it more dramatic, let's make the minimum with 600 pixels to make it a little more obvious. All right. As I make it smaller, notice how it's getting smaller, that area, but at a certain point it's going to stop getting smaller. So percentages used in combination with um, percentages, or percentages uh, for, for width used in combination with minimum width a lot of times is, is a good way to do it because you can keep it from overlapping when it gets too small. Now one thing I've done throughout this is I've had a border around each of the elements. Um, when you're debugging the CSS, if the CSS isn't working the way that you expect it to, all right, it's sometimes good to either put a border or to change the color of something temporarily to some color that's really going to stand out. For example, let's say, let me take the border off the navigation. And let me change that to something bogus, 64%. That's not right. We're just not broken. Have with make five hundred pixels an app. I'm just trying to do something goofy with this so that it doesn't look right. All right, there we go. All right. That doesn't look right. And let's say that I, I have no idea what is wrong with that. You know, what's wrong with the positioning of that. One thing I could do is I could put a color temporarily on the navigation section. Or a border or whatever. And I could do that for each of the different sections, and I can see exactly where the section starts and stops. It's like in this case I can see, oh, that navigation is gigantic. That's why it doesn't appear right. Okay. And then I can go and adjust the height or get rid of the height or whatever. And Okay, once it looks the way that I want it to, I can
I can then remove the collar and get back to normal. All right. So that's a very powerful debugging tool. So what debugging tools do you have at your disposal? Well, the first thing you can do is you can run it, go to W3, w3c.org and run it through the validator, the CSS validator. That will see if you've made any syntax errors in your CSS. If everything is okay there, then I would suggest when things don't lay out the way that you'd expect them to, go and temporarily change the colors or put borders around things or whatever. Then you can sort of see exactly what's going on and that might not be obvious otherwise. Okay. Next week, we will talk about floating, which is probably the trickiest of all ways to achieve a layout in CSS. And we'll also talk some about getting your pages looking good on a mobile device. What are some things that you can do and what are some considerations that you can take when you're making your page able to be viewed uh, on a mobile device. Questions? Typically, it's better to use percentages um, th than that. Uh, as a rule, the more flexible you make it, the more responsive, and again, the whole, there's a whole subset of web development called responsive web design. The more responsive you make the page, that is, the more aware that it is of the, the, the constraints of the device that the page is being viewed on, the better it is. So, yeah, percentages are better than absolute. Now, that being said, these are all tools, you know. Um, you know, this is kind of a ridiculous analogy, but I hope it makes sense, you know. Um, generally speaking, police cars are better than having police on horseback, right? Yet, they still have mounted police in some cases, right? Like when there's a crowd downtown Cleveland or whatever. So. There's, you know, these are all tools, and the idea of a tool is you find a case where it's appropriate to use it. Now, I wouldn't want the whole Cleveland Police Department to be on horseback, but in a special situation, that, that works. So, as a general rule, yeah, percentages are better. However, there could be a situation where an absolute number of pixels um, comes in. A nice little compromise of that is using the percentages in association like with a minimum width because that keeps it from getting too small. You know, the problem that you run into if you do things purely percentages is if you get the screen real, real, real tiny, it becomes real difficult to, to still make it look good at that width and at that width. Well, at a certain point you can say, all right, don't make that any smaller than X number of pixels and then it's flexible to a certain point, but it doesn't go beyond a certain size. Other questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.